Um, let's go ahead and start so we don't get too far off the schedule. Uh, I'm Doug Yee. I'm uh, the director of the Masonic Cancer Center. I'm also a medical oncologist, and you guys are at the uh, conflict of interest uh, part of our discussion. So the format's going to be very similar to the one that we just had. Uh, we'll have a really extraordinary panel of people talking about their e expertise and their perspective of conflict of interest. So, you know, one of the things Dr. Northington Gamble mentioned at lunchtime was that the way you think about things is sort of the way you were raised. So I would say I was professionally raised as a medical oncologist taking care of women with breast cancer. Uh, and one of the things that's really remarkable is that almost every prescription I write today for breast cancer treatment did not exist when I began my career in 1989, over 25 years ago. Um, so when you think about why that happened, it's because we formed very unique partnerships between women who were either at risk for the disease or had the disease, physicians, healthcare uh, systems, uh, academic hospitals, uh, federal funding, state funding, philanthropists, biopharmaceutical companies, media, and when I include media, I'm including biomedical journals in that context. So I think that our remarkable progress is from where I stand in, in, in medical oncology, and particularly in breast cancer medicine, is because we formed these partnerships and clinical trials and clinical research was performed. But at the same time, I think it's pretty apparent that each of those relationships has potential for conflicts of interest. Uh, and I certainly think that our extraordinary panel today has a different perspective and expertise on all the aspects of conflict of interest. So I'd like to start and introduce our first speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Eric Campbell. He's a director of the Mongan Institute for Health Policy and professor at Harvard Medical School. He's a sociologist with expertise in survey science. He also conducts research related to physician conflicts of interest and professionalism. So Dr. Campbell is first up. All right. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here today. I'd like to begin by saying that uh, I'm a third generation graduate of the University of Minnesota. I have three degrees from the University of Minnesota, and you are my people. <laughs> you are my people. I'd also like to say that for those of you that are got to wondering right now, that I realize I look like James Carville. <laughs> If you don't know who James is, get out your iPhone, look it up, you'll giggle in about two minutes and we'll all go, oh, they finally got it. <laughs> so I'm here today to talk about kind of conflicts of interest and in industry sponsorship. We're really gonna talk about, it at, about relationships, financial relationships that exist uh, with industry. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that I have two disclosures. I serve as an expert witness for the United States government on law cases related to the illegal marketing of drugs and medical devices. Um, and I also will not talk about any off-label use of or, and or investigational use of drugs in my presentation. I'm glad they got that, that last one in there. Um, so the work that we're gonna talk about today began actually with my PhD dissertation here at the University of Minnesota. Um, my advisors and I came up with to talk about what's the nature of industry relationships. We kind of came up with this together. She's sitting in the back of the room, but I won't point her out. Um, but the, the, these, these exchanges are really can occur, they're an exchange of goods and services between academics and industry. And, and they can really occur at multiple levels and in individuals. So this is just kind of a schematic that, that kind of outlines the nature of these relationships or these resource exchanges. And they can occur at the individual level, and these can take the form of research grants and contracts. It can take the form of consulting payments to individuals, gifts, pens, mugs, equity ownership, um, trips, samples, reimbursement, food. All of these things can occur between individuals and industry. It can also take the form of institutional relationships. And these often, as you can see here, take the form of patents, licenses, donations, equipment, program support, and support for even things like buildings. Um, I point these out because it's important to acknowledge that these are just the mechanisms by which these financial transfers occur. I'm not making any claims about whether they're appropriate or they're not appropriate. That's a different 
issue, you also cannot make assumptions because something comes in as a, a grant or a contract that it's about research. Many research, many grants and contracts that come into universities are simply about marketing company drugs. So don't make assumptions, but just look at the nature of the relationships. Today they asked me in 10 minutes to summarize everything that is known about the nature, extent, and consequences of academic industry relationships in the life sciences, and to do it in less than 10 minutes and five slides. So <clears throat> I prepared some slides. I'm gonna have to talk in generalities here. I can't give you a lot of specifics, but, but these are the kind of basic things I wanna talk about. So the first thing I wanna talk about the frequency of relationships, and I chose this slide because this is the work that we began, that began here at the University of Minnesota with a colleague named David Blumenthal at Harvard Medical School. And it began because we really wanted to understand the nature, extent, and consequences of these relationships. And what you see here, this was from a survey that we published um, in the journal Health Affairs. We published it, I don't know, probably about 1996 maybe, or 2006 or 2009, I can't remember. But it was about um, the nature of relationships we surveyed a random sample, a stratified random sample of researchers in all of the medical schools in the United States. And we asked them about the nature of the relationships, and this is what we found. About 20% have funding for their university-based research from industry. About 31%, almost 30, 32% are paid consultants for industry. 17% serve on scientific advisory boards. 5.9% receive support for their students. Almost a quarter are paid speakers. Very small number are employees of companies. Very few, about 5% are actually on the boards. A few look, get royalties. But if you take all these together and say, what percent have any financial relationship? The answer is it's more than half of all medical school faculty around the country have some form of financial relationship with industry, and we define industry as companies whose products or services relate to your area of expertise. It's about half. Also, I would urge you to keep in mind that these are likely unestimate, underestimates, because for many of these forms of relationships, we suspect due to social desirability bias, there may actually be some underreporting. So let's assume that this 53% figure is kind of a bottom level estimate. So I've also done some work looking at the nature of industry relationships among IRB members, because after all, IRB members often come from our faculty, their employees in our institution. Uh, we published this uh, article in the journal in JAMA Internal Medicine. Same basic thing, we identified the institutions, we drew a, a random sample of IRB members and asked them about the conflicts, of it, about their relationships, which by the way, if any of you ever have a thought of do, surveying IRB members about their own conflicts of interest, Think very carefully, it's a very challenging endeavor. Um, we got a pretty good response rate, oops, and uh, this is what we found, again, not surprising. So about 20% of all IRB members have, have funding for research, about 10% are paid consultants. Um, they have meetings and conferences, They're on a, about 9% are on scientific advisory boards, support for students, speakers, bureaus, and so on. If you add it up, about 30%, 31% of all IRB members have some kind of financial relationship with company whose products and services are related to their area of expertise. So remember, it's 53% of faculty, 30% of IRB members. Th these relationships also occur at the institutional level, and this is just one slide of data that we published. I think we published this in JAMA. Um, but what we did was we surveyed department chairs about the stuff that they get from companies basically the stuff their departments get. And here I want to point out that, you know, for example, 19% of clinical departments get unrestricted funds from drug companies uh, for their use. 30% get support for travel and meetings, 36% support for seminars, you know, 37%. There's a whole lot of eating going on. <laughs> and obviously drug companies don't care if the basic scientists starve. Very concerned about the eaten in the, the clinic, but just to say, the general patterns is, is that non-basic science departments generally do not have these relationships. These relationships exist pretty much largely at it, and then support for CME is 65%. That's just an, an example of the kind of the nature of the extensiveness of the relationships that occur, even at a department's level. 
Um, and I would go on to say, if you looked at this in terms of you know, stuff that universities and the whole get from industry, virtually every major research university has, if not one, many multiple forms of relationships with the drug industry and the device industry too. So if you take this all together and sum it up, this is kind of an uber slide. It comes from a whole bunch of places, but this is what you found if you say, all right, what does it look like in terms of the nature of relationships across the board? More than half of faculty researchers have some financial relationship with industry. It's 36% of IRB members. 43% of IRB chairs. 60% of all department chairs and 80, it's actually 85% of all practicing physicians nationally have some form of relationship with companies. The takeaway I want to suggest is that it is very hard not to recognize that the drug industry has very deep, very extensive financial in ties with virtually every major group that is involved in medical education medical research, and the practice of medicine in the United States. I often go to say these, these relationships are ubiquitous in academic medicine today. And what's happening in the trends, this will be my last slide, but to give you an idea of what's happening, um, since 1986 to 96, when the most current data is, the percentage of faculty members of scientists with industry support has decreased from 28% to 20%. That means a smaller group of people are getting this money. And by the way, they happen to be generally those highest on the food chain. Uh, industry generally doesn't support young scientists. They support the most advanced, most prestigious, prestigious amounts. The median amount of funding from industry in an academic setting is decreased from $99,000 in one year to 91.5. Basically, in industry, not only is it highly concentrated in a select few, it tends to be very small in amount and short in duration. And among IRB members, we saw, no oops, we saw no significant decrease in the percentage of IRB members with research support, but we have seen a significant decrease in the percentage of IRB members on speakers bureaus and who are receiving reimbursements to have been almost eliminated since the last time we did this study. Um, and there's, there appears to be, which I did, didn't present the data, significantly improved reporting of these relationships and there's absolutely no data on this in terms of trends at the institutional level. To put this in context, as we heard this morning, the um, funding for research has been decreasing at the NIH. Everybody knows that. It's also been decreasing among foundations. Many academic institutions have tried to turn to industry as a support system to make up the difference. What this data shows you, by and large, is that won't work for basic scientists. It won't work for junior scientists. It'll be small amount. It'll be short in duration. And so as we kind of think about these relationships going into the future, I think it's important to keep in mind the trends that we've seen, but also to notice that this is, again, a moving target. And it may have changed since we, we collected this data five years ago. And um, that's it. Thank you. As mentioned, um, everybody will be back on the podium for questions uh, at the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Bernard Lowe. He's the president and CEO of the Greenwall Foundation and also a professor of medicine emeritus and director emeritus of the program in medical ethics at the University of California, San Francisco. He chaired the Institute of Medicine Committee on Conflict of Interest in Medical Research, Education, and Practice, uh, and the report was published in 2009. He also serves on the Standards Working Group for the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which recommends regulations in stem cell research, serves on data safety monitoring boards for the NIH, and he's also on the board of the directors of the Association for the Accreditation of Human Resource Pro Protection Programs, or AHARP, and on the Medical Advisory Panel of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Dr. Lowe. Uh, thanks very much, Doug. I really uh, am honored and delighted to be here. Uh, I got to see snow again, which is a, a big thing for us folks from California. Um, so I'm going to talk today quickly about the issue of are our approaches to conflicts of interest ethically sound? So I'm going to try and be a little provocative. 
Um, I first want to make a conflict of interest disclosure. I sit on the board of the directors, board of directors of AHARP, and AHARP had an arrangement with the university to carry out an independent external review uh, of the University of Minnesota Human Research Protections Program. Uh, I'm going to try and cover a couple of topics today. One, what is a conflict of interest? I'm going to suggest we should focus more on bias rather than conflicts of interest. Second, what should be the goals of conflict of interest policies? And third, how can we address non-financial and institutional conflicts of interest? So as Doug mentioned, I had the honor of chairing an Institute of Medicine panel in 2009 that made a big report on conflict of interest in medical research, education, and practice. And I'm going to draw on this, uh, particularly with the con conceptual background. So what is a conflict of interest? That panel distinguished between primary interests, which for us is, as physicians and healthcare providers, is the well-being of our patients. As researchers, we're interested in the integrity of research and as educators in the integrity of the educational materials we provide to students. But there are all kinds of secondary personal interests that are ubiquitous, to use uh, Eric Campbell's term. Financial gain is the one that we've seen the most publicity about, but there are professional commitments, intellectual commitments, and personal relationships. And all of those can, all these secondary interests at some level have the potential to compromise or undermine our primary interests. So the definition our committee used was that a conflict of interests is an unacceptable risk that the primary interest is unduly influenced by the secondary interest. And what that means is the conclusions of the research may be biased, or the advice you give as a physician may be biased, or that the teaching materials you provide may be biased. Now, I highlighted in red terms that are value-laden and require judgment. So all of you are going to say, so what is an unacceptable risk? What, how do we distinguish those from acceptable risks? What does unduly influence mean? And what do we mean by may be bias? There's a lot of uncertainty there. And that's part of the, the difficulty and the challenge we all face. So this is something that is, is new since that 2009 report. Venn diagram, conflict of interest and bias. There's overlap. How much overlap? We don't have data. The relative size of the two spheres, is bias more common than conflict of interest or vice versa? We don't know that. But our assumptions about that have a lot to do, have a lot of influence on how we think about conflicts of interest and how we would design policies. One of the themes in my talk is we need better data. There's a lot of passion about conflicts of interest. It's an important issue. But let's try and make that discussion data-driven to the extent we can. So what should be the goals of conflict of interest policies? And I say goals because I think there's several goals. Certainly, we want to identify relationships that raise significant concerns about bias. And significant, again, is that term, what do I mean by that? What do you mean by that? <coughs> Disclosure of conflicts of interest, our IOM committee argued, is necessary but not sufficient. Unless you know what the relationships are, and Dr. Campbell enumerated the whole host of relationships, you can't assess the likelihood of bias, you can't manage them, and in some cases you won't know whether you want to eliminate certain relationships or not. Second goal, you don't want to discourage relationships that foster desirable goals of a university. You don't want to undermine your teaching, your clinical care, and your research by eliminating all relationships with industry. I think we'll hear later in the panel that increasingly academia, industry, research collaborations, partnerships, whatever you want to call them, are more frequent, larger, and perhaps necessary to develop new therapies for patients for whom there are now not good therapies. NIH public funding is not going to develop new therapies. C, 
A third goal is that the benefits of conflict of interest policies should outweigh the burdens and the risks. So all policies have desirable effects, undesirable effects, and unanticipated adverse effects. Policies on conflict of interest impose costs and effort on both individuals, uh, faculty members, and on institutions. How much should that burden be? I would argue that we should focus on the relationships that present the highest risk of bias. Willie Sutton's terms, go where the money is. Go where you think the highest risk of bias is, and let's try and get a handle on those relationships. Now, I would argue, and our report argued, that another goal of policies should be to have an empirically based quality improvement process built in. That one of the things our report said, we don't want people in 10 years' time to be tasked with updating our recommendations and have no data on which to base their recommendations. If we really take seriously this idea of continuous quality improvement, a learning healthcare system, we should be prospectively collecting data on what works and what doesn't. Uh, so I said I was going to talk about non-financial and institutional conflicts of interest. I want to keep this on schedule, but ask me or invite me back. <laughs> but not when it's snowing. Uh, so the take-home message, conflict of interest policies must balance countervailing goals and values. So it's hard. A lot of things we're trying to do. I would argue we need to address bias and not just conflicts of interest, not just relationships, but the bias. And I actually think that universities, like the University of Minnesota and other institutions that you come from, should take the lead in crafting policies that are wise, effective, and efficient. Thanks very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Thomas Morgan. He is the head of human disease genetics at the Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research within the Division of Biomarker Development. And he serves as a member of Novartis' ethics advisory group. Uh, he is cross-trained in clinical epidemiology, family medicine, clinical genetics, and medical biochemical genetics. As a Robert Wood Johnson's clinical scholar at Yale, he received advanced training in clinical epidemiology, healthcare systems, and policy, and he serves, continues to serve as a voting member of the IRB at the Vanderbilt University. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation. I, uh, I appreciate that. I want to um, appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak. And I have no slides today. And uh, the reason I don't have slides is that if um, one speaks at a public event with slides, they undergo review. Um, they're going to be reviewed by your company, and they would also be reviewed by the university. Um, and they would, uh, in that way, uh, influence what it is I have to say to you today. But, of course, I am employed by pharma, and so you shouldn't listen to anything I have to say. <laughs> but wait, if you do that, then you will listen to what I have to say, because it would be the opposite of what I just said. Um, the, the, um, what I want to tell you is why I decided to make the jump to pharma. Um, I was uh, practicing uh, at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital, doing something that I love, taking care of patients. Um, I was successful, uh, publishing, uh, obtaining grant funding, all of those things, serving on the IRB. Um, and the reason I left was I had an existential crisis, which uh, I think happens to most of us in mid-career, um, and we start thinking about you know, what Eric Erickson called generativity versus stagnation. Uh, will I plateau? Will, will I, um, you know, or, or will I flourish in some way and, and do what it was that I, I set out to do 
when I was an adolescent and I decided I wanted to become a doctor. You know, I had read existentialist literature like Camus, uh, The Stranger, and uh, I, I conceptualized medicine as a revolt against the absurdity of, of human disease. And, um, you know, I set out uh, about that. And in my, in my career in medicine, I found that um, there were some absolutely brilliant interventions uh, that, that I could uh, deploy in, in clinical practice. And like most doctors, I knew absolutely nothing about pharmacology. I knew nothing about how, you know, these, these drugs actually are created, um, uh, you know, what that process looks like. But gradually, I began to learn more about it. And the passion for improving treatment uh, took hold. And previously, there was a question about, you know, what percentage of research is funded by pharma? Well, if you think about um, clinical trials, it's about 85% of clinical trials funded by pharma. Um, so it's basically all. And we literally can't live without pharma. And everybody in this room without pharma would either be dead or have someone that they know or a loved one dead or suffering severely without pharma. So you're really stuck with pharma and collaborating with pharma does not have to be a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. And we need to do more of it, not less, in my opinion. And, you know, I speak as sincerely as I can to you that um, I, you, you may feel if you have negative thoughts about pharma that I'm misguided, but uh, please don't doubt my sincerity. I, I really think that this is where the real innovation is happening uh, in medicine. And in clinical genetics, one deals with absolutely devastating diseases. And I found that I was becoming an ever better handholder, a better, more compassionate giver of bad news. And that's just not enough for our patients. We actually have to uh, take that next step towards developing new therapies. And I, it may sound naive to some, but I still believe in the idea that a safe, effective drug is a gift to all humanity. And um, in, it's actually one of the greatest gifts of the United States and of many other countries that are relatively economically privileged to the rest of the world. Um, when penicillin was first created, it was worth more than platinum by weight. Uh, it had to, there had to be a national czar uh, of, of penicillin, uh, Chester Kiefer at Boston University, who would control who would get it because if you had pneumonia at that time, you would, you would die. And then a better um, method was developed of, um, you know, manufacturing penicillin in large batches, and it became cheap. And now, uh, if you wanted to, you could get a 55-gallon drum of it. And uh, it's, it's present throughout the entire world. So... The, there, there's definitely a lag between uh, innovation and the diffusion of new technology and therapy to the patients that need it. And we need to work to shorten that. And we need to have more investment and more collaboration. As for speech and conflicts of interest, I mentioned um, the sensitivity about speaking. And I've already seen that there were disclaimers that there'd be no discussion of, um, of off-label uses of medications or any promotion uh, or marketing of medications. And uh, I certainly will not do that. And as some of you may know, if I did do that, I, I could be arrested and I could be put in prison for that. And what some of you may not know is that that could happen even if what I said was true and even if what I said was not misleading in any way. Um, and this has been uh, a subject of recent uh, litigation. A company called Amarin um, has uh, filed a, a lawsuit in New York and, and won, um, uh, alleging that the, the FDA was violating their 
uh, First Amendment right to free speech by doing this. Another man's conviction was overturned, uh, who was a sales representative, um, who was put in jail, taken away from his family, for speaking something that everybody agreed was true and not misleading. And I, I see the anger um, uh, about conflict of interest, and I'm really afraid of the tactics that are, that are gonna be used. I think that um, taking doctors, putting up firewalls between doctors and their patients uh, has already happened. Uh, we already see cases where uh, a doctor who, who is passionate about a treatment cannot discuss that treatment with the patient directly. Um, why not instead have a second opinion? Let the doctor talk to the patient, but let there be a second opinion from a dispassionate person um, for, for that patient. I can see that soon there will be uh, calls to uh, shut down um, any speech by um, uh, people who have a conflict of interest. They won't be able to publish in medical journals. Some have been making that uh, sort of uh, claim. It hasn't come to pass yet, um, but I hope it doesn't. I, I hope that speech that people consider biased will be countered by um, speech from other sources that may be equally biased in its own way, but that is how to handle um, conflict of interest is, is to, to bring in a community of interest around it and try to mitigate these conflicts. Um, and I certainly agree on reasonable uh, reporting requirements and, and all of those things. And I, I'm speaking you know, as a citizen, uh, not as a representative of my company. These are my own personal views. And um, one speaks nowadays with considerable fear of uh, losing one's job, uh, not being invited to things, harming careers, et cetera. Um, so I, I really think that a spirit of collaboration is, is warranted and not to demonize uh, pharma. Uh, the people in pharma are parents, uh, they're physicians, they're scientists, they're uh, uh, people who, who, they're just people just like you. And um, I, I strongly believe that in that environment, ethics, the, the commitment to ethics is every bit as strong as it is elsewhere. Abuses occur in every system. Um, wherever there are humans, there will be you know, people who misbehave. And we absolutely must try to uh, eliminate that to the extent possible. But um, you know, that's the, uh, you know, my view on uh, the conflict of interest debate. And uh, I, hope, I hope for, for more debate and discussion in the uh, panel session. Our uh, next speaker is Paul Haluska. Uh, Paul is a medical oncologist and global director of scientific affairs oncology at Merck. Uh, that's a relatively recent job for Paul. I've known Paul for the 15 winters he spent at the Mayo Clinic, as Paul puts it, uh, and where he really worked on ovarian uh, cancer and breast cancer, and he helped develop with uh, the Mayo Clinic patient-derived xenograft models uh, known as avatars. Uh, in his current job at Merck, he runs the Investigating Initia Trials Program, for Merck's portfolio of drugs and cancer research, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about his experience. Great, thanks, Doug. Uh, I'll try to avoid any uh, Minnesota winter jokes. I think we've had enough uh, at this point. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for having me back, uh, even though it is December. Ah, oh, there it is—a joke. Uh, um, um, so yeah, my disclosure is perhaps a, a few comments about that. So yes, I am now a Merck employee and as part of my position, uh, full disclosure, I get uh, stock uh, as part of my job. Um, I also own intellectual property for some of the work that Doug mentioned on, on the xenografts that I still uh, have at Mayo Clinic. And again, in full disclosure, uh, so you all know, um, these are uh, models that uh, we developed a program. They're models uh, that uh, ovarian cancer could be put into mice, and so we contract out this work uh, to pharma and um, other biotech companies, and we, I receive royalties from those contracts, so I do uh, receive some royalties. Um, so I think uh, part of why I think Doug uh, brought me out here is I do have sort of a bit of a, a unique perspective. Uh, it sounds very similar to Thomas, though. 
our only difference is I have some slides, I guess, so. Uh, but it's a, a little bit uh, a very similar sort of uh, a perspective being from academia and now uh, in industry and seeing it from different levels. But even within academia, I feel like I had sort of, you know, a lot of different roles that uh, makes my experiences a bit relevant for some of the discussions today, and I've really enjoyed hearing uh, uh, some of the earlier talks. Uh, but I was a principal investigator at Mayo for many clinical trials. Um, I also led the phase one program in oncology, uh, co-directed for some time as well until my co-director uh, partner, uh, Chuck Ehrlichman, retired. Um, and as, as a result of that, you know, I had a lot of uh, pharma interactions. You, know, you can imagine uh, many pharmaceutical companies would want to do a trial at the Mayo Clinic and get their early drugs in at Mayo. And so um, I was at probably at any point on 10 or 15 uh, different advisory boards. And, and um, I have to say, though, uh, we received funds to do that, but I often would uh, put in my disclosures when I was in academia that Mayo received money on my behalf. Okay, so these monies that we receive um, for being like on an advisory board, uh, this wasn't going to the Paul Haluska uh, sauna or, or uh, hot tub. Uh, I ever received zero dollars, in fact, myself. Uh, this was money that went directly to Mayo to pay for my time. Uh, and so that's the reality of, a, of an academic uh, medical oncologist is, is that we are 100% seeing patients all the time. Every day I have to see patients unless I have a grant that will buy out my time or that uh, I can go to an advisory board and the sponsor pays for my time. That's the only way I can do activities. And while I was at Mayo, I'd say about 75% of my time was bought back out of the clinic to do research and do advisory activities uh, to help, uh, you know, really develop the agents. I received really no extra money. It, that's what it, what it wasn't what it really was about. It was more about, you know, I wanted to get these therapies to my patients. I wanted my patients to get the most advanced therapies to give them the, the hopes for the future. And so I think that's something that maybe a lot of the public doesn't really understand is that even though I would disclose these dollars. Uh, in the conflict of interest, it wasn't really, I never really felt conflicted from the money because I never really received it. Uh, it wasn't money that I personally gained by doing this, but it's, I wanted to do these advisory activities so I can get these, do, these uh, drugs and exciting new agents into Mayo uh, to treat my patients, give them the most hope of advancing uh, the science and, and improving uh, cancer. So uh, I also had a R01 funded laboratory. Uh, you know, I had at any time 10 or 12 people in my lab uh, running experiments, developing agents, and we received uh, grant funds and published, you know, manuscripts and papers, uh, the, the normal academic things that we all try to do. Um, but uh, in addition to being a clinical trial investigator, I was also on our scientific review committee, so I was reading others. Uh, others uh, protocols and uh, you know critiquing them and making sure the science was sound and make sure we were protecting our patients so that was a big part of what I did uh, at the Mayo Clinic uh, I guess in three minutes or, or less um, so uh, but that was great I had a great experience at Mayo uh, and now uh, at Merck uh, that experience I think has helped me for this position where now I lead the investigator initiated studies program and so basically I help Merck find out what are the best trials to do in the world uh, that will help advance uh, Merck's development of their agents. And so basically I interact with many of my old friends uh, in, in academia uh, that have great ideas uh, uh, to, to perform studies. And so basically I approve studies and uh, con uh, consents uh, and, and budgets. So um, I think the part of this uh, experience that I really want to kind of bring out to you is that um, I feel like when I was an academic investigator, I think the biggest conflict or, or bias actually that I may have been exposed to and my uh, colleagues may have been uh, exposed to is never really even addressed uh, as a clinical investigator. So, you know, we're always being asked to fill out our conflict of interest forms at, at, at meetings uh, uh, and for numerous things about stock payments and things that I never even really received, like the payments for these advisory boards that I was telling you about that I never received any dollars or the relationships. But I think the, the, the conflict that I always found was really a, a major problem for us in academia was our career. 
Okay, so I mean, when I'm talking to a patient about a clinical trial, of course, as since I have in, uh, you know, integrity uh, as an investigator, I want to do what's best for my patient. But in the back of my mind, uh, and again, this is the back of uh, probably every investigator's mind that is trying to become a professor or, or get tenure or get the next grant, is I got to accrue this study. Not only do I have to accrue this study, I got to be, I got a positive result. We get rewarded as academic clinicians for not being smart. We get rewarded for being successful. And that may seem, you know, uh, splitting hairs, but it's true. Uh, if I have the most smartest study done and it, it's negative, uh, but yet I detail it uh, to the finest degree, have great science, it's not going to get a New England Journal of Medicine. If New England Journal of Medicine published, you know, uh, 10, you know, negative studies that were really well done, you know, no one would read it. So they're looking for, uh, you know, positive studies. So success is, is an important conflict of interest that leads to, I think, bias. And so I think that's one thing that I think is very much uh, overlooked, uh, and no one really understands really how, how to address it. Uh, so I need a positive study. I need to accrue those patients. So how do we manage these conflicts? I don't think that we really have a good answer because as long as we have to uh, publish in high-powered journals that accept positive studies, receive grant funding, get manuscripts published, um, this is always going to be a major conflict that leads to substantial bias as an investigator. Um, and that's always going to be in the back of our minds until something about this changes. And we could talk a lot about, well, you know, what, what should we be doing about the journal situation anyway? I mean, it's an archaic method. Everything's online. Everything now is, you know, text and uh, electronic. Do we really even need hardbound journals anymore? So we can, we can certainly talk about that. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there'll be varying uh, opinions wide about that as well. But it does create uh, conflict and bias in my mind. But I think the thing uh, for the, uh, my new position um, which I could talk a little bit about is that um, there is a potential for conflict. Um, uh, we put a high value on key opinion leaders, and this was alluded to in some of the earlier talks. You know, who are the major drivers uh, uh, in the field? And this is not more or less to get them to put patients on trials or to uh, um, or, or to buy their opinions. It's more or less to understand how we can develop our drugs better and smarter. You know, what is the, the thinking in the world about how we should be developing the drugs? And so we put a lot of stock into, you know, the, the uh, ideas of the key opinion leaders, and we want to bring those in uh, to consult with them. And so I'll often want to cons uh, 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 bring together an advisory board of the key opinion leaders to get their ideas about, you know, how do we get this drug to our patients? We believe it's, it's going to be the, the next greatest thing, and, and we think it really can help a lot of people. How do we get it to them? How do we get it to them in a very ethical manner? How do we get them to it in a smart scientific manner? And so this is why uh, we, we're often engaging sort of the clinicians that have, uh, you know, the gray hairs and have been around for a long period of time because they have a lot of experience that can help us. Um, and, and, and what I've also found about uh, being an industry is that it's a highly scrutinized uh, 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 industry. There's no doubt about it. But I think uh, this is a good thing, and it has, has been the sort of the result of, of some problems in the past. But I think I'm very much uh, very comfortable with how, uh, how honest and how much compliance and integrity goes into uh, the uh, funding of clinical trials. Uh, we have a very uh, strong fair market value process to make sure that there is uh, no um, you know, uh, bribery type issues that maybe have happened uh, decades ago. Uh, I think that uh, was a big problem. Uh, but now anti-corruption laws that we have in place uh, are, are very strong and, and ensure that we are as uh, fair and as compliant uh, as, as humanly possible. Uh, we also make clear through public uh, disclosure uh, what payments are being made. Uh, but still, there's bias. You know, if I had to take a, in front of you a map of the world and put a pin where every clinical trial that we fund is done, you'd see a huge collection of pins uh, in the northeast of the United States. 
Well, is that where the most brilliant people in the world are? Well, some may say. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's where we are. We're in New Jersey and, and, and Pennsylvania and Boston. And so there's a bias because these are mostly the people that we know. Uh, most of the people that work uh, at Merck, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the investigators that we have on, on board have come from the Northeast, I, I being one of the exceptions. Um, but uh, my, my role is to kind of spread that out and, and bring some more scientific rigor uh, to make it be more about the science and not the, the, greater, uh, the greatest investigators that we may think we know. Um, and so some of the things we're doing now uh, through my leadership, uh, through the scientific uh, um, um, directorship is to uh, eliminate or at least reduce some of that bias as best we can uh, through an NIH style process to, to give out some of these grants. Um, but I've also been very pleased uh, with, uh, again, the, the ethical rigor uh, for which we have uh, uh, established two documents, and these are both publicly available. You can read about them, but these are kind of my Bibles uh, that I live by, uh, and uh, I was always very uh, pleased to find uh, these, uh, these guidances available to me, and, and really we do follow these very strongly, and I'm sort of the, uh, the gatekeeper of these for all my colleagues that assist with uh, the clinical trials program uh, at Merck. Um, but I think they all go back to uh, you know, a comment many of you may have, or a quote that you may have heard from, from George Merck many, many years ago, uh, that is that the medicine is really about the people. Uh, we do good medicine, we do it for our people, and the profits will follow. Um, I'd have to say I, I heard more talk about uh, the bottom line and the profits when I was at Mayo than I've heard about, heard about any kind of profits at Merck. We don't talk about it, and, and that was kind of surprising, um, but because really everyone has bought into that idea that really it's about the science. You do good science and the profits will follow. So we're here to, to uh, do, do good work for our patients. Thank you. So we've heard a lot of, a lot of discussions about journals, so let's have uh, Dr. Robert Steinberg come to the podium. He's the editor at large and viewpoints editor at JAMA Internal Medicine. He's a contributing writer for JAMA and professor adjunct of internal medicine at Yale University. He was a deputy director and national correspondent for the New England Journal of Medicine and a medical writer for the LA Times. He is a general internist and trained in internal medicine at UCSF. Dr. Steinberg. Thank you, and I'm um, very I'm delighted to be part of this um, excellent uh, conference. So when I was asked to speak, we discussed what I would speak about, and I was asked to speak from the role of a medical journal editor. And obviously, different people can look at the issue of conflicts of interest from different perspectives. I'm not speaking as an investigator. I'm not speaking as an institution. And I will try to focus on where I think there are areas of agreement and disagreement. I think my views will come through. But I think in talking about it as a perspective of, the, of a journal editor is not simply my views, but simply how do journals in general look at things? Where do they agree? Where do they disagree? So um, there are three parts here. I'm going to move quickly. Uh, but I really think that the first part may be more important than anything else which I'm going to say, which is to understand what we are talking about. Uh, because if you understand what we're talking about, then I think everything else follows, and I'm being uh, too overly simplistic here, but if you don't get the issue, then everything else doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, Bernie already talked about the Institute of Medicine report and what the definition was and the uh, the risk that the secondary interest is going to influence the primary interest. A uh, couple of points I want to emphasize. The conflict of interest is the situation. It's the circumstance. It's not a determination as to whether or not the, there's actual influence by the secondary uh, interest. This is amazingly misunderstood uh, because people somehow feel that they can divine whether or not there is a, uh, an actual influence. And the fact that most of us can't divine these sorts of things, unless I believe that, is one of the reasons why there are conflict of interest policies. Uh, this is an article which was in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, almost a quarter uh, century ago now. It was soon after I started there as a deputy editor. I was not involved with it by Dennis Thompson, who was at Harvard. And he wrote a, um, 
what we call a sounding board about understanding what it is. And I think this is the key point. The rules do not assume that most physicians or researchers let financial gain influence their judgment. They assume only that it is often difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish cases in which financial gain does have improper influence from those in which it does not. So if we use uh, Dr. Lowe's example of the Venn diagram and that area of bias that you may recall in the middle, can we reliably determine which situations are there in the area of bias and which are not in the area of bias? And that is really what the issue is. Uh, because if we could go into people's minds and know whether things have been influenced or not, then perhaps we could have different policies. Uh, to give one other example of this, uh, someone looks at studies uh, by, which are funded by industry, an academic investigator, and they say, well, it couldn't be biased because these studies either were uh, negative, they didn't show a, a difference between the new treatment and uh, standard care, or they showed that the new treatment was uh, not, uh, not beneficial, was harmful. Uh, so, but how do we interpret that? Could it be that actually the new treatment was a little bit better than it looked, but someone was concerned that they would be looking as in industry's camp if it looked, uh, if it was made to look that way, even if it was a really bit better? Or suppose it was a neutral study, it was a negative study, but no benefit, but in fact it was really worse. So this is the problem that we can't necessarily understand and glean, read people's minds, and that's why we need to have policies, and that's what journals are concerned about. So let me go briefly to what I see as areas of agreement. Uh, journals are important. We can have a separate discussion about the changing role of journals as uh, scientific communication changes. But if you're going to have medical journals, I would argue that they need to be sources of unbiased, independent sources of information, build trust in medicine, trust in the medis medical literature. I can tell you as a journal editor that one of the most important things is the integrity of the journal. What we publish can't be right 100 out of 100 times. Science changes, people make honest mistakes, et cetera. But we want to try to aim to be as close to that goal as possible. Uh, disclosure. Uh, disclosure is important. Uh, disclosure should be complete. I think pretty much 100 out of 100 medical journals would agree, journal editors rather, would agree on the importance of disclosure. Uh, I do want to make two secondary points here, which is that a disclosure is a lot more valuable if it's written like other parts of an article so that you can understand what is being disclosed. If you have to Google a company to find out or something else to understand why something is being disclosed, that's not great. You don't want somebody who's reading a journal article, the text, to have to Google every other paragraph to understand what's trying to be said. So I think it's very important when you do disclose things if you actually explain what you are disclosing. Uh, and if journals hold uh, authors to that standard. And the corollary point is uh, disclosure does not mean every single interaction with a company or with a uh, employer over the last 20 years. I think it's important to determine what's relevant to the study, uh, what's not relevant to the study. Uh, one can always have the uh, uh, ICMJE, the International Com uh, Committee of Medical Journal Editors Forum as the backdrop, which is a uniform way of disclosing information. But I still think that we can err in both uh, directions of under disclosure and over disclosure of things which really aren't relevant to the topic. Uh, so uh, in terms of financial associations, uh, these are topics we could come back to. I will just say that there are all sorts of, uh, of uh, associations which uh, Eric Campbell uh, gave you that full list. And I'm sort of using language of what's least problematic. If it's bona fide research, particularly if it's bona fide research which goes through usual academic channels, not directly into somebody's salary, uh, and if there's consulting, it has a clear scientific purpose, those are the sorts of things which are the least problematic. Those are also, parenthetically, I think, the sorts of relationships which are most likely to advance patient care and to advance basic research. Uh, when there are research studies with authors who develop the products and hold patents or receive royalties as authors, uh, those are problematic. Uh, we could discuss uh, questions about whether one can never have that or the ways to management. Uh, I would just say at this point, those are problematic. There's no way around it. Um, and then finally, conflicts of interest, as uh, has been mentioned, are a potential source of bias. And journal editors have to consider conflicts as they do other sources of bias when evaluating manuscripts, deciding which to publish, and requesting revisions. 
So now let me go to briefly to some areas of controversy. Uh, the first, I'm, many of you may have seen this, uh, I'm just putting it up here because of the title, uh, Confluence, Not Conflict of Interest, Name Change Necessary. Uh, the term itself, the idea is that it's pejorative and we should talk about alignment of interest, not conflict of interest, etc. Uh, there's a lot of ongoing debate, we're talking about areas of controversy now, about this whole issue, and we'll probably come back to that. There are people who uh, deny the importance of what I am speaking about or talking about or would say uh, that it's been overblown. Uh, there are people who feel that there's a zealotry on the side of um, uh, people who are concerned about this, and then there are people who feel uh, that what we've been doing has maybe not even been enough, and that this has been a difficult course, but we should, we should stay the course. So that's one area, if you sort of think in a step back a bit of a big sort of philosophical way, is what are we talking about and how important is it really? That's number one. Uh, and then there's the particular issue, which is who should write uh, for journals and does it matter what type of article it is? And I'm gonna highlight two areas here very briefly. The first is editorial and review articles, and I, I won't go through all the history, but the New England Journal of Medicine, 1984, under um, the late Arnold Relman, uh, established the first conflict of interest policy at a major medical journal. Uh, the key was disclosure. That's where it started, and we're still talking about disclosure today. Um, in 1990, Dr. Roman was still the editor. The policy was extended to prohibit authors of editorials and review articles from having any financial interest in a company or as a competitor that was discussed in the article. Uh, that policy was considered, was continued by the two next editors of the New England Journal, uh, Jerry Kassir and Marsha Angel, and then in 2002, under the leadership of the current editor of the New England Journal, it was changed in an important way in 2002. This is still the current policy. Policy only applies to significant financial interest, uh, otherwise comparable language. Uh, meanwhile, the British Medical Journal, as people who follow this may know, did not have such a policy in the past. In 2014, they went in the other direction. So effectively, the British Medical Journal now has the policy which the New England Journal no longer has a decade plus later. Uh, question we can come back to, is it possible to find outstanding authors with the needed expertise and without a conflict of interest? We're talking about editorials, review articles, opinion articles here, we're not talking about every single article a medical journal publishes. I'm not talking about research articles. Uh, reasonable people can disagree about that. Uh, and also it's resource intensive. Uh, it is often possible to answer that question, yes, but it may take more time um, than if one is not as concerned about conflicts of interest. Uh, finally, I want to talk about, uh, this is my last slide, I want to talk about the conflicts of medical journals, at least in a general way. Uh, every institution has certain things which, which affect them as institutions, as entities, as businesses uh, trying to continue and to be successful. Uh, it is true that there's competition for authors and for research articles that are likely to be highly cited. Uh, clinical trials, well done clinical trials on important clinical questions tend to be highly cited. There are also very high levels of scientific evidence. Journals are in the business of publishing manuscripts, not blank pages. Uh, they are interested in publishing uh, high quality randomized trials. Many of them are supported by industry. And many have various relationships, if you read some of the language in the method sections, about how the control and the decisions are sorted out between the authors who are not in industry and the authors who are in industry. So that's one issue. Uh, revenue from the healthcare industry is important. Again, many journals have different business models. I would say that there's probably less importance in a big picture sense of uh, advertising revenue than there used to be, maybe 10, 20 years ago, less of reprints just because of the web, uh, more of institutional subscriptions from this and other large academic medical centers paying for access to all of the faculty and the, and the students, but it's still an important source of revenue. And I'd also say that um, journal editors, uh, conflict of interest policies are just as important uh, for us as they are for anybody else that we're talking about. And if there were more transparency about the finances of medical journals, I think it would enhance credibility and trust. Thank you. I'd like to op uh, invite the panel back up and then open for questions. So, uh, 
if you have a question, please raise your hand. You'll get a microphone and speak loudly into the microphone. And similarly with our panelists up here, please speak into the microphones when you're answering. So there's a variety. There's one here, and then there's, I think there might be one in the back as well. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for a great panel. Uh, direct my question to Tom Morgan, and then others can pick up on it if they want. You talked a lot. Uh, so let me just preface by saying I'm actually sympathetic to the argument that you made that we need uh, high-quality collaborations and valuable collaborations for, for patients and, and for health. Um, you, you talked about uh, companies as um, sort of potential partners in these collaborations. And the implication there was one of trustworthiness. And you said either explicitly or implicitly that companies are trustworthy partners in this. We've talked a lot about trustworthiness and how to regain trust, both in the lunch talk and then in the morning. As you know, there's a lot of examples that one can cite through recent history of companies that were not living up to that standard of trustworthiness. And uh, you, you made it seem like it was sort of isolated events, isolated individuals, that sort of thing. But the, I think the data would suggest that it's a bit more systematic than that. And you might argue that it comes from more from the marketing side of the companies than it does from the research side. Ultimately, they report to the same CEO, same board, board of directors. So how do companies convince those? I mean, there's obviously a sort of climate of skepticism, which you decried. How do companies convince the public, the academic community, patients, et cetera, that they actually are trustworthy uh, partners in this um, collaborative, engaged relationship that you're seeking and that, like I said, I actually endorse? Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, point. And um, clearly, uh, companies around the world need to do better. And um, I would say, though, that academic institutions have a role to play here, because the reason why pharma um, pays people is because they don't work for free, right? You can't get a clinical trial done um, without actually paying the investigators and paying the university. And so um, that explains why it the so-called conflict of interest is apparently so pervasive is that people demand pay for work. And, um, you, you know, that's, that should continue and it should increase as far as I'm, I'm concerned um, because there's much work to be done. But, yeah, a zero tolerance policy for anything that uh, smacks of bribery or, you know, anything illegal or, um, you know, must, must be rooted out. Now, th this is certainly not... Um, just a pharma issue. I mean, this happens in government, it happens in academia, it happens everywhere. So we all have to be alert to it and we all have to report it if we see it. Go ahead, Dr. Lowe. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, another comment that's a little bit different. Uh, first, I would agree with Steve Joffe that one of the reasons we're talking about this is that it has real consequences for patients. So that within the past 30, 20 years, there are several examples of widely prescribed drugs, COX-2 inhibitors, like Vioxx, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression. We heard this morning about how hard it can be to treat depression. Well, there were studies that there were many examples of suppression of negative data, manipulation of clinical trial data, provide favorable results. Now I want to echo Dr. Morgan's point that on many of these studies, there was a professor at a reputable academic institution who was the principal investigator. And I guess I'm old fashioned, but I think when you're the principal investigator and first author, you get the glory and you should take the responsibility. And a number of those examples, recurrent, not just isolated, the investigator said, yeah, I was first author, but I really didn't play an active role in designing the study. Someone else did. I didn't really write or revise the manuscript. Someone else did that. And I think that's a failure, not of industry. That's a failure of the academic investigators and the academic institutions that allow those attitudes to, to continue. So there's a lot of room for improvement by all the stakeholders here. But if what we're really talking about, and we heard this this morning, is to provide better treatments for patients who right now don't have options, 
I think we need to have drug companies carry out the development, the clinical trials, because it doesn't happen on NIH dollars. It doesn't happen except for uh, the, the, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. There aren't very many drugs that are developed by academia. We just don't know how to do it. That's not our expertise. So if we want treatments, industry knows how to do that. But I think academia has to, together with industry, uphold the highest standards of rigor in published research. I mean, we have standards. It's not just opinion when we publish in a peer-reviewed journal. I mean, there are standards of what makes a good clinical trial. You don't go around selectively citing data, changing the endpoints after you've peeked at the data. That shouldn't happen. Now, I will also just add another thing, which is one of the real problems, and it bedevils industry a lot, I know uh, your CMO is really concerned about this, is the non-reproducibility of published research, both basic science research that identifies drug targets. They can't be verified by industry. They try and replicate a study and they can't do it. I think industry has also taken the lead, some industries have taken the lead in sharing clinical trial data, saying that the essence of reproducibility is allowing someone else to look at the research, carry out an independent analysis. I don't know if Barbara Beer is still here from uh, the Moldy Regional Clinical Trials Group, but that's a partnership between Harvard and a number of industries to set common standards for sharing clinical trial data in a responsible way that allows other in independent investigators to both replicate the study and to carry out additional secondary analyses and meta-analyses. And I guess I hope we'll see that as an important check or verification of the uh, accuracy, the rigor, uh, the trustworthiness of published results. Any other comments from the panel? Actually, I would like to ask Dr. Campbell a kind of a follow-up to that question. So you did a really excellent job of enumerating the frequency and types of uh, patent conflicts or payments that go to various institutions, IRB members, individual faculty that are involved in clinical trials. Do you, are there any that are particularly problematic that should be banned? Um, um, so, so I think that, is that on? Okay, so, so I, I would um, echo the uh, concern voiced by the Institute of Medicine panel on which Bernie was a chair. I was a member. We identified several forms of industry relationships that were viewed in, 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 upon review of our group to be inappropriate. They're primarily those that are promotional in nature. Our committee and the Association of American Medical Colleges and and now probably more than half of the universities, for example, have said, have banned faculty participation in speakers bureaus. Speakers bureaus are by definition promotional. A, a person on a speakers bureau must cede their intellectual independence to the company. And for that reason, our committee and the, and the AAMC committee said participation in speakers bureaus by academic faculty is not only unethical, it is unprofessional. I would say overall, relationships that are primarily aimed at selling company drugs for academic physicians are inappropriate because I know my university doesn't have as a mission to sell drugs. And my theory is if you're an academic and you want to sell drugs, you should go be a drug salesman and uh, we'll find other people to take on your academic roles. Okay, thanks. But, well, I would, I would say it's, it's not that simple, really. I mean, uh, some of it is, you know, we're looking for drugs for our patients, and we want to give our patients uh, the opportunity to receive some of these agents. Um, I would agree that, uh, you know, seeding your, your intellectual independence is probably not a good thing, and, uh, and at Mayo, we, we were never allowed to do speakers bureau and bureaus, nor did we want to do them. But uh, the interactions were really to, to help our patients to get the, the, the most exciting uh, possibilities for treatments for our patients. So. Okay, other questions? He, down in this. Okay. Can, I, okay. can so, I ask one? Yeah. Thank you. I have the mic, right? Sure, you've got the, the, you got you. the, you've got the talking stick. So talk. I'm uh, uh, Charles Ladonia, Director of Spine Research. Um, so I come from the medical device 
uh, perspective. If you have a, if you need a hip replacement, you don't want an engineer to design it, right? You want an orthopedic surgeon to design it. So I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement that you know, collaboration between industry and physicians is a must. Now, where you have conflict is when you have to get paid for it. That's, that's the thing. So there's a change now in the medical device industry where uh, consultants from academic, academic centers choose not to get paid, but they still collaborate. So I, I think that's a good compromise but again, it's also an unfair compromise because you're still giving your time you know, out of your busy practice you know, to, to benefit the company to make millions of money, you know, to make millions. So in, in other words, there, there should be some point of um, collaboration or agreement where you, know, you, get, you don't get paid too much or something like that, or there should be a compromise. Otherwise, the industry itself, you're going to lose innovation. Uh, right now, we're going to, uh, in about five years, China is going to, you know, be ahead of us. Uh, Israel is probably ahead of us uh, a lot, but we don't know because we're conflicted. <laughs> so, anyway. That's, that's uh, okay. just to say... But uh, let, me, let me finish. So, <laughs> my question is... Okay. How do you address, how do you make the U.S. again the most innovative, innovative uh, country again? If, if, we're, if you disagree, then tell me as well. Or, or lead the way. We're still leading the way in you know, medical innovation. Uh, but we, we need to you know, uh, stop uh, looking at profits and looking at more for uh, uh, the patient betterment of patient care. So with academia going to industry, I think that's a good move because now you have the influence of uh, you both to tell the drug companies, you, you know, it, it's not all about the money. It's really all about the science and, you know, making patients better. Well, Thank you. So, so I would suggest that you attempt to go into a room full of surgeons and tell them that they need to volunteer their time uh, outside of the OR to, to help a company make money for itself. And, and, and my other point is, I think, and it is true, with industry actually, by definition, it is all about the money because at the end of the day, they develop drugs and they sell drugs to make money. That is what they're there for. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're just like any other industry. They're not bad. But you can't say it's not all about the money because it really is all about the money. I, I, I'd just like to answer that. Um, I, don't, I don't see that. Uh, if I saw that, I would leave industry. Uh, could be that I'm fortunate in the company that, that I chose or chose me. But um, we've got to solve a problem, okay? When a clinical trial is completed and it shows... Um, that a drug is safe and effective and an improvement over existing standard of care, um, that, that drug doesn't diffuse itself into clinical practice, okay? Not everybody reads the New England Journal of Medicine every week and all the other journals. And um, while, you know, <clears throat> we're trying to achieve moral perfection, um, in, in choosing who is going to do this education of the hundreds of thousands of physicians out there, uh, patients are not getting that drug and they are suffering harm because they're not getting that drug. And so if you have a better solution, um, then by all means, bring it up. Do you guys want to come to I mean, I, I, I don't know I could say it any better. I think yeah. I agree that I feel that we're, we're in this, sure, as a business, but it's, we're helping people. So, and uh, okay. you can look at it from the other aspect, uh, less people are dying because of some of the things we're bringing forward. Okay, Dr. Loeb. Doug, let me try and say some, a few things here. First, I think we really have to be clear about what we're trying to say and what we're thinking about. So I think, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. The questioner raised a very important point about devices versus drugs. So if you talk to people who are inventing things and trying to take them to market, there's a much greater back and forth between the inventor 
and the device company. Lots of modifications, back and forth, tinkering. Second point, in this society, for better or worse, we reward invention discovery. Think of all the startup companies that are hoping to get rich on a great idea. So I think there's a fairness issue if we are going to have a patent system, a royalty system, and we do, then it can't be all bad to allow people to get some financial benefit from the mission. How much, what kind of payment. And I think we need to distinguish discovery of devices from the pivotal clinical trials to evaluate devices, from the education, dissemination, marketing, it's hard to separate all those, with a product that really works. And I think there are risks in how you do the pivotal clinical trials. And we saw that in the spine arena with the product called bone morphogenic protein 2 that was used in conjunction with uh, uh, spinal uh, surgery, uh, where the investigators who did some of the early pivotal clinical trials had a clear interest as consultants, as uh, uh, patent holders of, on the device, being PI of the clinical trial. And I just think when you really believe in the work you're doing, there is a natural human tendency to interpret things in a positive light. Now, sometimes you go beyond that and deliberately manipulate by not counting consecutive cases, by mislabeling adverse events. But there are ways of designing clinical trials that tr try and increase the likelihood that the results are really valid. And that's not to say you shut out the inventor from doing the trial, but you don't want that person, it seems to me, evaluating subjective endpoints, and you don't want that person controlling the analysis and the drafting and the writing. You can be a co-investigator, but you shouldn't necessarily be the first author. So I think there are specific things we can do to try and reduce the likelihood of bias. And it's complicated, it's situation dependent, but I think we really need to do that. And these are not easy questions. Question here. Uh, Susan Wolf from Minnesota. I wanted to invite you all to talk about institutional conflicts of interest too. I mean, Paul, for example, mentioned his former institution getting the compensation for some of his external work. Um, it seems to me at this point practically every, maybe literally every research institution has policy on individual conflicts of interest. It seems much rarer to see policy on institutional conflicts. So what institutional conflicts do you all think are problematic? And where do you see good policy emerging? Well, maybe I could just start by, by clarifying that, you know, I mean, the, the money that would Mayo and, and other institutions around the, the country would receive is to pay for me not being in clinic seeing patients. So it's really a, a break even, if you will, to, to compensate for the fact that I'm not there seeing patients bringing in revenue for the institution. So that's kind of the way I saw that, those payments being made. But I, I think the, the bone of contention I always had was that I was always being seen as the one that was receiving those funds. And really, I wasn't really receiving any zero dollars really for it uh, because I wanted to be part of that board so that I could be part of the developmental plan to make sure that these agents came to Mayo for our patients. Um, but uh, but that's, I just wanted to clarify that. But I, I think it, it seemed reasonably fair to me. So I, th I think that... One of the problems we have is that we have a fundamental problem in the structure in which we finance academic medicine. And that is that we allow our medical schools to create a, basically an unlimited number of faculty on soft money. And what that means is the medical school, by and large, takes absolutely no responsibility for the salary of that person. And what happens is it creates an opportunity in which people become 100% completely dependent on outside revenues to, to support not only the research, but their salaries. And that, I think, creates a dependency, which sociologists talk about resource dependency theory, but it's the nature of the fact that you're so dependent on these outside sources of funding to support yourself. 
I think can have major issues. The issues that, that I would love to see are changing the fundament, fundamental mechanism by which primarily clinical faculty in hospitals who hold appointments but who also do research um, fi find a way so that they are not dependent on extramural resources for a huge percentage of their salary, but actually have their institution have a financial interest in supporting a portion of their salary as well. Okay, quick question there, then we'll go there and then there. To Dr. Wagner and then here. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, you know, I brought up before that with industry trials, I mean, and, and what's the investigator's responsibility and the industry's responsibility, and, and trying to think of, you know, what are the different aspects where bias can be introduced? And one of those for me, you know, as, as an investigator might be, you know, patient selection. I could have uh, cherry picking patients to be better uh, for, or worse, whatever you want to, whichever way you want. Um, but one of the things I'm concerned about is that how do we best evaluate the data, especially if you have a larger trial? Let's say a 300, 500 patient trial, you know, if I'm submitting to the journal, I don't actually necessarily see every piece of raw data. A statistical analysis is done by the company. Um, has anyone ever addressed that of how do you have an independent review of that type of analysis? Because as the investigator, I might write up the study, but I can't really say to you, I've looked at every piece of the data. You know, I may have helped clean up the data to evaluate you know, or to ask questions to the, of the different centers, but I don't actually see the actual, all the raw data to be able to say the analysis is done correctly, or I don't even have the expertise to be able to say that the very complex statistical analyses are done correctly, but yet I'm the one writing the study and making the conclusions based on the data given to me. Um, let, me let me start with crack at that. Uh, there are, there are various ways in which things can be done. I fully appreciate your point that big studies, different people have different expertise. Uh, there are issues about are the data have integrity, are they complete to begin with, and then there are issues with the statistical analysis. Uh, there are examples where, I mean, if there are no academic authors to put an overly simplistic case, well then, I mean, the authors should be the authors. So it, it, the standard with journals is that there are, are at least the major journals, is there ought to be some authors who are independent of the company, independent of the sponsor would be the right word, and take, can take uh, responsibility for the integrity of the analysis. Uh, the statistical analysis can be done by people who are also independent of the, of the company, and there will be a contract and things of that sort. It could be done in-house. Uh, but there, there are flavors of this, and obviously if there are people from a company who fulfill authorship criteria, they should be authors. But you get flavors where you have maybe one or two company authors out of 20 or 30, and then you also have flavors where you have 20 out of 20, and as Eric mentioned earlier, everybody also happens to be on the speaker's bureau. I'm not talking about a particular study. So I think there are ways that you can go in one direction as opposed to the other direction. I think there are models from different places around the country of how one can, can do this in a way that many people would think that that variable has been taken out of the equation. Any other comments or question here? Bill Gleason from Minnesota. Dr. Lowe, I, I wrote down when you gave your talk, as I found it interesting, the, a quotation that NIH funding will not lead to new therapies. Now, I may or may not agree with you depending upon what that means. And what I'm driving at is we have faculty members here at the University of Minnesota who have found antiretroviral drugs and have sold them for millions of dollars, and there are people at Northwestern who are in the same situation. Now, I have worked at 3M for 10 years, and I would say that at 3M we used to think that academics always thought that their intellectual property was worth more than it really was. Now, do you mean about when you say an NIH funding will not lead to new therapies that we've eventually got to go to industry to get these things clinical trialed and so forth, or what do you mean exactly? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to clarify what sounds like was a, a misstatement on my part. NIH does not take new th targets, new therapies to FDA approval. That's what industry does. In fact, uh, NIH is encouraged under the Bayh-Dole Act to spin off entities they're going to focus on taking drugs to market. Uh, NIH 
we think, we like to hope as taxpayers, provides the new ideas, the new targets, the new approaches, uh, the new molecules or, or whatever. Uh, but I think the point I was trying to make is without the expertise and the big investment, and we're talking about billion dollars to bring a new product, to, over a billion dollars to bring a new drug to, to market, it's not going to happen on public funding. So thank you for the opportunity to clap back. Question right there, and then we'll get a couple extra minutes because we started a little late. Okay. So Jeff Bakken, University of Utah. That um, this is maybe for the panel broadly, and I wanted to bring it back to the uh, human participants. Uh, what do you think ought to be disclosed to research participants about conflicts uh, that uh, either the investigator or maybe the institution has? And I'm asking particularly in light of my understanding of some of the literature, which tends to suggest that a sizable portion of people misinterpret that information. That if Dr. Botkin's got a piece of this device, it must be pretty good, uh, and therefore uh, uh, I probably ought to join up with this study. So, is it an ethical obligation to disclose this? And if so, uh, is there an obligation to uh, describe in more detail why we're disclosing it so that it's a little bit more of a buyer beware sort of uh, uh, attitude that we're fostering? So, just on, the, on the, the notion of disclosing what conflicts your institution has, as a faculty member at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, I can assure you that I have absolutely no idea the full extent and consequences of my institution's conflicts of interest. They are so broad and so deep that it would be impossible with a ream of paper, probably, to disclose those. On the other side, I, I early in my career, had an opportunity to meet with a mom who had a child that were enrolling in a clinical trial, and I asked her if it bothered her that the, the principal investigator um, owned the intellectual property, and, and she said, you know what? I want that person to have every motivation possible to find something to make my child well. Um, we in, kind of think that people are going to see these as um, bad things. I think patients actually see them as good things. Patients can misinterpret these things. Uh, they may see that there's an investigator who's working on an industry-funded clinical trial and assume that they're a good doctor and a good scientist. It may just be that they're a real low prescriber and that getting put on this study under the guise of this study is a mechanism you can use to get the prescribing bumped up a little bit. I'm not saying that happens all the time, but I'm saying with all of these relationships, the potential for how patients will interpret them and how they can be structured to achieve ends that are scientific and that are commercial in nature is, is really fraught with danger. And I think what it comes down to is I think there has to be an individual case-by-case -case assessment by the IRB as to what should be disclosed and what shouldn't. I, I just want to say in response to that that it's true that um, one's patients are often proud of the doctor, right, when they find out that um, someone's invested in, the, in them. Um, but I, I would not, under any circumstances, presume to provide the patient with the correct interpretation um, of, the, uh, of the relationship. I think that they're more than capable of making up their own minds about that. Um, and I, I would just reiterate that Harvard Medical School, University of Minnesota, um, Pharma, and all of those collaborations are overwhelmingly a force for good in the world. Um, and I haven't heard anything today that would change my mind about that. Oh, let's go one last question and we'll close the session. I, may, I, I don't know if this will be helpful as a closing comment, but <laughs> yeah, the, the reason why we have this is that we agree, I think, that there can be overlap of the mission of industry and the goals of public health. The problem is, it's not a necessary overlap. There is the mission of the for-profit industry, and sometimes it coincides, and sometimes it doesn't. And I noticed that the two you know, people who are affiliated, obviously, if I were working as a doctor in those companies, I would try to focus on those areas that overlap, clearly. But what really gets us into trouble is the behavior when they don't overlap. And that's the issue. 
Comments? I, just one, no, again, I don't know if this is a concluding comment, but I would, uh, we've talked a bit about IRBs and uh, about academic institutional roles. Medical journals get papers at the end of the process to the extent that when protocols are developed, contracts are reached, when there's IRB review, uh, there's experience with what works and what doesn't work, uh, what's likely to raise concerns about bias, what is quite unlikely to raise concerns about bias. I'm not talking about a particular product or a particular drug. There are ways to approach this sort of upstream which make for less problems downstream. Uh, the other thing we haven't mentioned and we'll elaborate on is trial registration is a very good idea. Come from medical journals. You can't know uh, to look for some data uh, if you don't even know that a, a study is ongoing and it's started. So stop there. Okay, we're, we're already a little bit over, so I'd want to thank the uh, panel and thank the audience for this great session. We'll come back in 15.